Uh, thanks very much, David. It's, uh, it's great to be here today. Thanks to, to uh, the Australia Institute and to Chifley uh, for sponsoring uh, Ed's visit as well. I, I can see an old mate over the back, John Kerrin, a, a former Labor Treasurer. Uh, we don't have any of my parliamentary colleagues uh, here today. Thanks, Barnaby. So, <laughs> but, a, uh, but, a, but a welcome, uh, a special welcome to Ed. I've had the privilege of knowing Ed since he was a minister in, in the Brown government. Uh, over our careers, both of, both of us have experienced political life after political death. Uh, we have both lost our seats uh, in unexpected circumstances. I've fought my way back. Ed is dancing his way back. <laughs> There's a lot in this Gangnam style, Ed, and, and I might get a, a, a tutorial later on. Now, anyone who has seen Ed uh, on his feet uh, in the British Parliament, or for that matter, as we saw before, in Strictly Come Dancing, will know that he floats like a butterfly and stings like a bee. Now, of course, the first part of that is an exaggeration, uh, as we saw before. <laughs> I'd like to see you up again. <laughs> Agreed. Um, but what he has done is danced his way to be the people's hero. So it's great to have him here because, to keep the analogy going, Ed and I have tangoed together before. Uh, we worked together on the Inclusive Prosperity Commission. This was an American body. Uh, we produced a report a couple of years ago, and it was formed to explore what social democratic approach to economics might mean in a post-global financial world. And that commission's report of 2015 warned that the primary challenge in Western liberal democracies is neither military nor philosophical, but it is economic. More precisely, the primary challenge is inequality. The big shifts in wealth and income inequality, which have grown globally in the last 40 years, were greatly exposed during the recession. And they now not only threaten economic growth, but what they threaten is confidence in democracy itself. Two and a half years on from the publication of that report, our politics is still being shaken by the underlying changes in the economy, which were exposed during the global financial crisis. And I talked about this uh, in this place almost three years ago, where I launched uh, my book. And, and then I highlighted the threat that growing inequality and growing corporate power represented to our democracy. Now, while these two, two threats are still threatening uh, Australian, uh, Australian democracy, we've not seen the extent of that here that we've seen where there have been political earthquakes in the UK and in the US. And of course, there are many reasons for this, and I'm looking forward to hearing Ed talk about that. But to understand our current economic challenges, we do need to rewind and go back 10 years to look at that defining event of our time, the global financial crisis or the Great Recession. As we know, next month marks the 10th anniversary since Northern Rock experienced the first run on a British bank in 150 years. Now, while Northern Rock was soon eclipsed, uh, by even greater financial catastrophes across America and Europe, it was one of the first signs that the global economic system was teetering. And when I stood here three years ago, I outlined the Labor government's robust response to the GFC. What we did, why we did it, how we did it, and the fights that we faced along the way. And I believe now, 10 years on, it's time to re-examine the GFC and assess what enduring policy lessons can be drawn from it? And this is one of the driving motivations of the project that we're, we're working on, the GFC Plus 10 project. Now, I know many of you in the room might be a bit skeptical. You're thinking this was all 10 years ago. Why does any of this matter today? Well, the GFC matters today because it isn't just a, a debate about Australia or one crisis, and most importantly, it is not 10 years old. It's a debate that goes back 80 years to the Great Depression, to the publication of Keynes' general theory, a debate about what role government should play in the economy. Keynes's book famously foreshadowed the post-World War II welfare state, where for more than three decades it underwrote the golden age of capitalism before it succumbed to the trickle-down project of the 1980s. The arc of the trickle-down experiment reached its peak with the events of 10 years ago, 
and of course the political aftershocks like Donald Trump and Brexit are still being felt today. Now for me this debate is both personal and political. On the personal side, I've had a lot of people come up to me and say, oh Wayne, you've changed your tune on, on policy. I, I receive that frequently. I make the point that I've been deeply engaged in these debates all of my political life. I've written books on unemployment. I've talked about these issues. I've written many articles. But I, there is one part of this rap I am prepared to cop. I have changed my policy tune. And it was the GFC that changed it. If you're engaged in the public debate today, you should be required to answer one very, very simple question. Which core assumption about how the economy operates did you change between 2007 and 2010? Think about that for a moment. Which core assumption would you have changed in that period? Now, if you answer none of them, then you're either a genius, and there weren't too many of those during the GFC, or you're a charlatan. That's the truth of it. For me, I was aided not just by ex my experience during the GFC, but by the brilliant scholarship of Thomas Piketty. I can see now more clearly how growing inequality is the inevitable consequence of the 40-year dominance of a particular policy mindset. I now see how inequality damages growth, how it makes our systems more fragile, how it makes our systems more crisis prone and how it has a similar effect, a similar effect on our politics. Now this isn't to say that market forces are not important. They are. Market forces are a force for good when they reward hard work, when they reward effort and enterprise. But I can see upon reflection the bastardisation of the market, the rampant abuses, the corruption, the ruthlessness by some market players has severely blackened the reputation of markets. And policymakers around the world now acknowledge this. You'd have to be suffering some particular form of ideological blindness not to see that. So this is my confession up front. Now back to the story. Opponents of government action have a passion against government's role in the economy that is at least the equal of my passion for it. And you have to ask yourself why? Why, if all of this 10 years ago is ancient history and the case against intervention was so obvious, why are so many people still trying to demonise those interventions? And of course this is where you get to the crux of the matter. Policy passions for the GFC are undimmed because they matter. They matter a lot to both sides. What the last 10 years has confirmed and which the Conservatives and their media business supporters cannot acknowledge, is that government intervention actually worked. So if we accept the fundamentally and, and demonstrably false Conservative narrative that laissez-faire would have seen us through the crisis, then the next economic crisis, and there is always another economic crisis, will result in mass bankruptcies, mass unemployment and mass human misery. So as much as anything, that's why the GFC really matters today. Australia came through the GFC by choice, not by chance. One of only two economies to avoid a deep and devastating recession. Elsewhere, stimulus gave way to austerity that prolonged the length and depth of recessions. Our stimulus package created a new template for handling future economic crises. And of that, I'm proud, and I know the Labor Party is incredibly proud as well. I'm also gratified that a majority of Australians recognise the soundness of that approach. Recent polling by the Australia Institute found a majority of Australians, a remarkable 62%, agreed that the GFC would have sent the country into recession if the Labor government had not taken rapid steps to provide large fiscal stimulus. Only 22% disagreed. And just last week, a poll in Tony Abbott's electorate, which is the third highest income earning electorate in the country, 
found that 54% su supported the stimulus, including 43% of Liberal voters. So 10 years on from the crisis, there's a small but very influential group repeating the myth that it didn't work, that Australia's success was due to a combination of a robust Chinese economy and a resilient mining industry. They will, of course, accept any explanation or grasp at any straw rather than concede the effectiveness of Keynesian economic policy. But their position has always been and remains completely indefensible. The facts are against them, dead against them. China's growth did support stronger domestic growth from 2010 onwards, but it had little to do with Australia's performance during the criti critical year that followed the collapse of Lehman Brothers in 2008. Now, those that hold up the mining industry argument uh, ought to look at what Treasury Secretary Ken Henry had to say at the time. Had every industry shed as many jobs as the miners did in the aftermath of the crisis, unemployment would have more than quadrupled from 4.6% to 19% in just six months. So the experience of other countries does provide a sobering analysis of what would have happened had the deniers been in charge. Now you, think it might, you might think it's indulgent that I'm talking about stimulus in this way, but what my appearance today is about is learning the lessons for the future. It's not just about the past. What does this mean about how we approach future economic policy? Within the past year, our current Prime Minister and his Treasurer have explicitly tried to discredit Australia's response. The truth is, without structural intervention, the Australian economy would have suffered the same skills and capital destruction that dragged down most other advanced economies. And as a result, our democracy would have been weaker. But the strength of our democracy stems not just from our actions during the GFC, it stems also from 30 years of median household income growth. Australia has done much better than virtually any other advanced economy. And here's the rub. The difference between having a Hanson in the Australian Parliament and having a Trump in the White House is as simple as the difference between having 30 years of wage stagnation in the United States and us having 30 years of wage growth here. Now, in recent years, it's become clear that we're not immune to the sorts of economic trends which have brought other Western liberal democracies to the brink. Here, the share of income going to employees is at its lowest level in almost 60 years when records began. Underemployment is at its highest rate in almost 40 years when records began. Private sector wage growth is at its slowest rate in at least 20 years when records began. The devastating political consequences of the neoliberal model across the developed world are now evident for all to see. And that is why the embrace of the Turnbull government of that model is a threat to growth, living standards and political stability in our country. If we're to avoid going down the American road of rampant inequality, of a hollowed out middle class, of armies of working poor, we desperately need sensible fiscal and monetary policy to sustain full employment. Full employment must be a central objective for a progressive party. We need policies which give a stronger voice to working people and build a world leading progressive tax system. Taming corporate excess through reforms to corporate governance and encouraging long-term investment over short-term speculation is a very high priority. The merge, purge and gouge mentality of some corporates is economically counterproductive and deeply damaging to our social cohesion. I should really mention here the, the recent behaviour of the Commonwealth Bank, or for that matter BHP, two of our largest companies. What they demonstrate is there is a, 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 a need for a radical shake-up of board selection. Consider this figure. In the last 10 years, less than 15 people have been voted off ASX 200 boards. 
there are in total 1,500 seats on the, on, on the ASX 200. Now, if we had an outcome like that a loss, uh, across, let's say, three parliamentary elections, our democracy would be described as an autocracy. So there's a very big problem when it comes to corporate Australia. In Sweden, leading shareholders propose a short list of alternative candidates for company directors. A similar system could be proposed in Australia, and that would bust up the directors' club quick smart. The economic challenges we face are not insurmountable, and Labor under Bill Shorten and Chris Bowen and Jenny Macklin have articulated a clear alternative to the Turnbull trickle-down. Our future political stability and economic prosperity demands that we draw the lessons from our past and the experience of other countries like the UK who have walked further down the American road. We can avoid the political earthquakes they have experienced. Our future stability, both economic and political, demands an understanding that a strong working class, a strong middle class, are sources of growth, not a consequence of it. Our political stability and economic prosperity demands we recognise that social mobility is the key to an optimistic society, that inequality isn't just unfair, it's inefficient. When inequality explodes, it erodes faith in our institutions, undermines our democracy. So Australians now have to decide whether you want to pursue growth with equity to achieve stability or increasingly resemble the social and economic disaster that is the modern United States. Falling real wages for a generation, mass blue-collar unemployment, drug ep epidemics, rising working class mortality rates, so the list goes on. My message today is it's not too late to turn back. The policies have to be found. The politics have to be won. And that's why the project that Ed and I and Chifley uh, and the Australia Institute are working on is such an important piece of work. Thanks for coming today. Thank you very much indeed for um, inviting me along today. What a great honour it is to um, speak to this national press club. And uh, in the drinks reception we had beforehand, it was um, very humbling to see the, um, the pictures on the walls of the very distinguished Australian but also international speakers that you've had um, here in this club over now very many years. Um, on the other hand, I think probably in the pantheon of speakers who have both been a cabinet minister in Britain and a former professional dancer, I may be unique. And uh, <laughs> in that case, I have a um, small but special place in the history of this uh, club as from today. Thank you very much indeed to the, the press club, but also um, to, to Wayne Swan and uh, the Australian Institute in Chifley for um, inviting me to come to Australia to tour around with, with Wayne, talking about the financial crisis and the lessons we learned. It's, uh, it's very important for reasons that, uh, that Wayne has talked about and I'll expand uh, upon. He's right though to, um, to say that both of us have had long and varied uh, careers and have worked together closely over the years. Wayne is the, the third longest standing Labour Treasurer in the history of, um, of this country, um, more than six years at the Treasury. I managed um, more than eight years at the Treasury in the, the UK as a Minister and uh, Chief Economic Advisor. Gordon Brown always used to, to joke, the former Chancellor of the Exchequer in Britain, about the, um, the Latin American Finance Minister talking to his Cabinet colleagues in a crisis and saying, friends, we've come to the edge of the abyss and it's time for a bold step forward. And uh, it's often the case, if you are a Finance Minister, that you're often faced with rather unpalatable choices. Um, we both um, experienced political life and political death. If you said to me, though, in 2015, when I lost my seat, that within two years I would be uh, nominated for a BAFTA television award for the television moment of the year, dancing Gangnam Salsa with a 26-year-old Russian professional woman dancer, I wouldn't have believed you. <laughs> On the other hand, if you told me that Jeremy Corbyn would twice be elected leader of the Labour Party, <laughs> David Cameron would lose a referendum, Britain would be leaving the European Union, George Osborne would have become editor of the Evening Standard and Donald Trump would be president of the United States, I wouldn't have believed you either. So uh, <laughs> it's been quite a destabilising couple of, um, of, of, of years. Um, it was actually a great experience to go and do that um, dancing show as we saw on the, the show, but I actually learned rather a lot um, in, the, in that exposure 
um, of reality TV um, uh, about politics and, and, and life as well as um, uh, a little bit about uh, dancing. I think maybe unlike Donald Trump, I also understand very well that, um, that, that reality TV is rather different from um, governing. Um, and uh, I hope that that's a lesson he will eventually learn as well. I was actually talking to Wayne last night, though. There was one particular moment very early on in my uh, time on the show last uh, autumn. Uh, the nature of prime time uh, entertainment television is you have an intensity of production values and um, uh, which is just so different to the kind of thing that you experience in, um, in politics. We're used to arriving with um, a studio with, um, with four or five staff, maybe one or two, the interviews you sometimes do. In, in entertainment television, it's very different. There is just huge staff and huge meticulous attention to detail. There was a particular moment back in, in early September where um, we were doing um, the filming for the, the opening shots for the show. We had to have one move. It took us three hours to do it. Um, there was a director and a massive great crew, and me and my partner both had each um, a person who did our makeup, who personally did our hair, and a person who did our wardrobe. And between every shot, the director would shout, check, and all these six people would run on to make sure that we were fully assembled and back in shape, ready for the next uh, shot. This had gone on for about two hours in this very big, dark, dusty uh, studio. And um, the director yelled, check. And only five of them came out. My wardrobe guy wasn't there. And I said, excuse me to the director. I said, before we go on, I said, could I have the fluffer? And, uh, and he looked at me and said, you want what? <laughs> and I said, the fluffer. He said, um, he said this is a family entertainment show. He said, it's not the sex industry. What are you talking about? And I said, oh, no, I want the guy who was coming on to take the fluff off my, my, my jacket. And um, he said, look... Just so you understand, that is not what a fluffer is. <laughs> and that is not what a fluffer does. And uh, I left the studio none the wiser. I was told afterwards that actually, I don't know whether you know, a fluffer is somebody who comes on uh, between shots in an adult entertainment show to make sure that the male star is ready for action for the next... Uh, once it was explained to me, I was absolutely clear I wasn't asking for a fluffer, just for the, the avoidance of, um, of, of doubt. Anyway, so I learned a few things along the way in that rather unusual period in my, in my life. It's um, good to be here, though. It's been quite a turbulent time. And, um, you know, to, to, uh, to see uh, a prime minister under real pressure being driven day to day by destabilising events, a coalition in tr trouble, a party divided, uh, trying to resolve uh, issues through public plebiscite because you can't get a consensus in your caucus. So it's um, very good to put British politics aside and come to the, um, the relative stability and tranquility of Australian politics as I've been experiencing over the last few, uh, few days. But it's not the first time I've been to, to Australia. And the very first time I came actually was in the beginning of the 1990s. I was a journalist at the Financial Times um, just before I went to work with Gordon Brown and saw um, and came and studied firsthand the work which had been done here by um, the Hawke-Keating um, period of Labour government, the work of the, the Accord. And it was a very important period in my sort of policy and political development because in contrast to um, the Thatcher-Reagan approach, the Washington Consensus, a view that the smaller state was always better, the privatisation and deregulation was the right way forward, what you had here in Australia was a view that you could work with the market economy, you could deliver stability in the economy, but also... You could make the economy work for working people. You could have a welfare state and pensions which people could rely upon. You could work with business and with trade unions. You could have rising living standards. And that accord, I think, was a very important uh, shaping of my political uh, views. And um, in the early period of the Labour government after 1997, we tried through our central bank independence, but also our national minimum wage, tax credits, investment in the health service, um, the, the, uh, our welfare to work policies to learn from that Australian uh, experience. And we had some marked success in the early 2000s in terms of delivering stability and rising living standards. And then we had the global financial crisis 10 years ago, which um, Wayne um, has already talked about, and which unleashed after that a period of slow growth, of, um, of stagnation in wages, of rising uh, inequality, not just in Britain, but in America, and many other developed um, countries, and also 
a political reaction to um, politics and to politicians and to governments, to political instability and uncertainty, to um, some of those decisions I referred to earlier, not least um, the referendum defeat which we saw in Britain over our membership of the European Union. It's been a very difficult, destabilizing time the last 10 years, and those years continue to challenge us. And I think it's very important that we, uh, as Wayne says, learn, and you learn by challenging your assumptions. You ask, what were the things I thought about the world, and, um, and where were they wrong as well as right? So I'm going to take up Wayne's challenge, challenge and try to prove that, um, that I can learn um, and I'm not a charlatan. There was um, three different assumptions I think I had about how the world works when I came and studied the Australian economy in the early 1990s. And I think these were a set of assumptions which are shared not just by progressive governments but, but by many politicians of left and right um, about how um, our economies worked throughout the 90s and the, the 2000s before the financial crisis. Assumption one was that the main source of instability in our economies came from governments making mistakes. Too much inflation, too much um, deficit spending, and that if you had a sound approach to monetary policy and got your fiscal policy right, that was the best way to ensure stability in the economy. And the second assumption we had was that with globalization beginning, but also technological change, our huge challenge was going to be stopping people on the lowest incomes, people with lowest skills, falling behind. That, that most people in the middle would keep being better off, but the unskilled would fall behind in this world of new technology. And that thirdly, globalization, which in the 70s had been about the movement of money around the world, was going to be about the movement of goods and of trade, that this would be challenging because would companies move their production from Britain or America or Australia to India or China? Would you have that kind of offshoring and how would we deal with that? And in some ways, I think the, the political reaction the last 10 years, which we are still dealing with, comes from our misunderstanding of all of those three assumptions. First of all, and most simply, we had a global financial crisis which happened at a time of low inflation and relatively low national debts. Actually, we were all pursuing pretty sound monetary and fiscal policy, and we didn't see the instability which came out of the financial sector in America, but also around the world. Uh, we didn't see that it was regulation uh, and the lack of regulation or the lack of tough regulation which would be the source of instability rather than inflation or fiscal mistakes. And um, the consequence of that was a global financial crisis in its aftermath. The second thing which we didn't see was that inequality wasn't going to be, as we thought, about the bottom falling behind. Certainly in Britain from the early 2000s, from America from before that, maybe in Australia more recently, the issue has been people on the highest incomes seeing their incomes shoot ahead, while median earners, people in the middle, have seen their wages stagnate as well as people in the bottom. So it was, and in terms of jobs and technology, we've seen an absolute increase in unskilled jobs, an absolute increase in high skilled jobs, and an absolute fall in middle skill, middle wage employment. If you think of a bank, a bank today will have as many top paid executives and as many cleaners and drivers and security guards, but many fewer people doing middle skill, middle wage jobs, which have been displaced by sophisticated technology. And the biting of technology change into middle incomes was a surprise to all of us. And then thirdly, in the case of the UK certainly, um, globalisation turned out not only to be about money and trade, but also about the movement of people. We've seen migration of people on a much, much bigger scale than any of us expected in the 2000s. And when you look certainly uh, in Britain and in America at the election of Donald Trump or the referendum on the European Union, the issue, the top issue was people believing there'd be insufficient control and management of migration. That was the, the top issue. And it was an issue which we didn't foresee. The question is how do we respond to all of these kind of the, these pressures because uh, the reality was the elite, the governing elite, didn't deliver stability. People who thought they'd worked hard and played by the rules on middle incomes saw their wages stagnate and globalization has often got the blame, sometimes because of trade and offshoring, but certainly in our economies at least as much 
um, aimed at migration um, and people who've come to work um, and haven't played by, in the, the view of uh, working people, the same rules. And I think there's two mistaken reactions you can take to this. One mistaken reaction, which I have to say you still hear quite a lot, is if we just put our heads down and wait, it will all be okay in the end, and we can get back to the way things were uh, before. And I don't think that's going to work. You can see um, the, the, the way, the, the direction our politics has taken, simply hoping that we can go back to a more free market view isn't going to work. It's not going to solve that wage stagnation and that discontent. But the opposite reaction, which is to think, well, in that case, let's swing to um, nationalism, to turning away from the world, to populist solutions. That's also a catastrophe. That is the route to low productivity, to, to low wage growth, um, turning away from working with business and trade in the rest of the world isn't going to work either. Which goes to the core crux issue of Britain's issue about the European Union. There was a problem in Europe. We did need to sort out the issue of free movement. Migration was a problem. But if the solution comes turning your face against our major trading partners, well, that's clearly a pretty catastrophic thing to do. And that's what the government is now attempting to avoid in its negotiations. I think instead, looking at those three things we got wrong, there's three important positive lessons we should learn. The first is, you've got to make sure that you have policies which deliver stability and growth for the future. And as Wayne said, here in Australia, and in Britain too in 2008, we took action to sustain growth at the time of the financial crisis. Wayne's stimulus was the right thing to do. He was right to carry it on. We made a mistake in Britain to stop it in 2010. Wayne did it at a time when it was the, a difficult and unpopular thing to do. I have to say, it's very interesting to me now coming to Australia again and reading on the plane as I came here, reports this year from the IMF and from the OECD, both telling Australia, if your economy slows down this year, make sure you stand ready to use active fiscal policy to support growth in Australia into 2017-18. It sounds to me like, um, belatedly, Wayne Swan is winning the intellectual argument about the importance of fiscal activism. But there's not been enough action since 2010 by governments together to sustain and promote growth in our economies. Without growth, it's very hard to deal with this discontent. Secondly, we've got to find ways in which we can increase the earning power of median as well as lower skill workers. We've got to find a ways in which we can make our economy work more fairly. We need to make sure our tax system, our welfare systems, um, our, uh, our education and public services support wage growth of people in middle and lower incomes and make our economies fairer. And I'm very encouraged by the speech Bill Shorten made a few weeks ago, putting this issue of inequality at the centre of the debate here in Australia. I think it's vital that we do so. But thirdly, and this is where um, I take um, a different approach from populism um, and some of the policies which are put forward in America and sometimes in Britain as well. We can only do this by international cooperation. If we turn away from the global economy, we'll be cutting off our nose to spite our face. And the only way we'll solve issues of fair multinational tax, climate change, uh, sustained growth and fair trade is through international cooperation, countries working together rather than standing uh, um, aside and saying one nation first is the right approach. And this is my concluding point. Australia and Britain, we have always been economies which are open and outward looking and internationalist and embracing of trade and new ideas and people coming to our countries to work and contribute. And that's got to continue. We've also been countries which have always taken seriously our obligations to the rest of the world and in particular to developing and emerging market economies who need to become more part of the global economy. And thirdly, we've always been countries which knew we had a responsibility to our own people to deliver fairness and social justice. And those three things we must keep at the centre of our thinking as we face up to the challenge of the global financial crisis 10 years on. And I think without international cooperation between our countries, we won't be able to, uh, to, to solve these problems and, and rise to that challenge. That's why I was really proud to be asked to come here with Wayne and the Institute to start talking about these issues. And let's make sure that we deliver that legacy in the years to come. Thank you very much. Thank you.
Ed Balls, uh, Wayne Swan, thank you both very much. Uh, we're going to move into the questions now. I'll kick things off. I just want to go to, I mean, you've raised a whole uh, series of issues there that are really interesting. One I think there'll be little disagreement on, though, is the need to uh, uh, get the earning power, improve the earning power of those middle income earners and I suppose medium skilled workers you talk about as well. How do we do that? Well, I, th I, think, I think first of all, um, we have got to get our economies growing more strongly. And I think the reality is across the developed world since 2010, there has been um, an insufficiency of aggregate uh, demand. And I don't think we've seen enough leadership either from the US um, or from uh, the European Union. I think Australia actually has done much better than uh, other countries, certainly in the early part of the decade of sustaining that growth. But it's really hard to do it on your own. Until 2010, there was a consensus. We all had to act together. And that consensus broke down, and that was um, a, a retrograde step. Secondly, we need to ask, how can we uh, improve productivity in our, in our economies? And, um, and th th that is really hard, but it's something which we have to, um, to understand and work on. But I think the third thing is, and Wayne will say more about this, is that um, inequality is a drag on growth now in our economies. It's causing insecurity. It's leading to, um, uh, to, to, to people being less willing to take uh, risk. And... Um, and I think it's, it's, it's also leading to populist um, and reactionary pressures. And so I think tackling inequality is an important part of improving productivity growth. Well, I think in the, the last budget, the government uh, missed a golden opportunity to substantially invest in infrastructure as well as in uh, human capital to boost demand, to, to strengthen the labour market. They talked a, a big talk about it prior to the budget, but when you look at the figures on infrastructure investment, uh, Commonwealth infrastructure investment trails off. We desperately need a boost to demand uh, in our economy, uh, particularly when wage growth is so low uh, and there's a squeeze on low and middle incomes. So the second part of that equation is that we don't put in place a set of policies which actually uh, repress or suppress those on low and middle incomes. The truth is that in our economy, the job creators are people on low and middle income, on low and middle incomes. It's not just rich people. And the sooner we learn uh, that, um, you know, a wage increase for a worker is a good support for someone else's job, the better. So we've got to strengthen our demand in our economy. We can do that through the deployment of fiscal policy. But we've also got to learn that when we are changing fundamental structural policies in our economy, we don't do it in an unfair way. And we've got a perfect example of that unfairness in the government's uh, increase in the, in, in the uh, NDIS surcharge, the increase in the Medicare levy. They are effectively making our system far less progressive uh, than it should be in an environment of low wage growth. They're putting a tax impost on everyone up to $87,000. And that is the last thing you need in a low wage growth environment. All right, our next question from Shane Wright. G'day, gentlemen. Shane Wright from the West Australian. Uh, Mr Swan, you mentioned in your speech um, full employment and how that should be the aim of progressive parties. Full employment is, as you would know, a part of the RBA's charter. Yep. I'm just wondering whether you think the RBA needs to rethink its approach because you've both talked of government, but central banks were there all through the GFC period. And to you, Ed, the Bank of England's chief economist recently made some interesting remarks about the lack of power of workers in Britain and effectively said they had, that power had fallen back to levels that they hadn't seen since the medieval period. How important is the power of the workers slash unions in getting a change and movement across wage and income? OK, well, we've been through a period globally of very loose monetary policy, and the reason we've had that loose monetary policy has been because governments around the world were unwilling to deploy fiscal policy. So they basically passed the parcel to the central bankers. We can't, they said, uh, stimulate our economies because we're ideologically opposed to it. So you, central bankers, do everything you can to support demand uh, and therefore jobs across the global economy. Now, we fortunately weren't in that position but you could certainly argue that as we go forward, the enormous challenges we face in the job market, uh, insecure work, uh, the casualisation of our workforces and so on, I think do demand a much stronger focus on the objective of full employment. I'd love to see a project 
which is not unlike the full employment white paper uh, that, uh, that came through, uh, in, you know, through Chifley. Because the labour market these days is vastly different. So it's not just as simple as saying, uh, you know, what we're going to do with uh, interest rates in this environment. It's a vastly different labour market, uh, and we need to take that into account when we're developing our fiscal policy and our monetary policy. I, for one, uh, would argue that maybe in the short to medium term, we will need a larger public sector if we are going to achieve full employment. So there's some big issues there. Uh, and they're the sorts of issues uh, that we talked about at our roundtable this morning and we will continue to talk about over the next 12 months. Sure. I think uh, our central banks have taken a very kind of far-sighted um, and sane approach to managing our economies in the last 10 years. And Wayne's completely right. They've done so despite um, um, challenges placed upon them by some governments who didn't do their bit. Um, if our central banks had taken a, a normal view of the unemployment inflation trade-off, they'd have been raising interest rates as unemployment fell. But the reality is the wage growth has stayed very low indeed. And our central banks have been right to keep interest rates low to, to, to sustain what has been relatively sluggish overall um, growth. And, and Wayne's completely right about public uh, investment. The comments Andy Hand that... Ha that Andy Haldane made were really interesting, uh, the Chief Economist of the Bank of England. On the one hand, he was pointing out um, something which is kind of big and structural in our economies, which is, I talked about technological change and the way that had changed um, um, the nature of employment. Uh, the reality is um, that if you have a big shift to technology and machines being able to, um, to do jobs um, which were previously being done by middle-skilled workers, that changes the... Um, the power dynamic between capital and labour, and that is part of the explanation for the wage squeeze. Now, there's no doubt that technological change is a good thing, and it's making us better off, and it's transforming all of our lives, as many people with, with iPhones here will know. But there is a cost and consequence to that, which we have to think through. We've also seen, over this period, a decline in trade union uh, coverage, um, but that's also reflecting a change in the nature of work. And the change of the nature of work has some positives and some negatives. On the one hand, the gig, the gig economy can be in very empowering for people who are wanting to shape their working life around their non-working life, to be able to run a business but do um, some shifts as an, as an Uber driver or whatever. But we have to understand the consequence of that is a huge amount of, um, of risk and responsibility shifts from what normally would be collectively pooled by an employer. You know, um, I will guarantee your hours and your wages and your pension and your sickness benefits onto the individual who takes all that risk onto themselves. And at the harshest end, that leads to young people underemployed on zero hours contracts, being, uh, finding it very hard to um, make ends meet. Now, the reality is that that new aspect of the labour mar market as we were discussing this morning, often there isn't an employer or a workplace, and therefore this demands um, uh, a very different approach to um, organisation and representation and the role of trade unions. But uh, I think Andy Haldane is right. Without that, at the moment what we're seeing is a very large shift in responsibility and burden from companies who are well equipped to deal with it to individuals who often aren't. Our next question from Catherine Murphy. Hello to both of you. Uh, I just want to pick up on uh, your point, Ed, about uh, international cooperation and international linkages being important. Obviously, there are populists both on the right and on the left uh, who uh, have a, well, quite a, a visceral strain of isolationism in their political rhetoric. Uh, we see Donald Trump stoking a trade war, perhaps. Uh, it sort of seems as though the, the kind of the, the middle ground in support of free trade has been fundamentally eroded because no one is actually making the case for why free trade or fair trade benefits working people. So can I invite either or both of you to make the case why free trade benefits working people and also why, uh, why free trade assists with inequality, uh, sure. makes inequality better? And just one more because I'm greedy. <laughs> Uh, is there? Do we need to uh, do we need to look at 
at trade as a concept is it, does it fundamentally work and people have just forgotten it works or do we need to look at uh, things like distributional equity or how we how we share the benefits well free trade is comprehensively on the nose because it has produced large numbers of losers uh, in many developed economies uh, and uh, exhibit a here is america in the three states the three democratic states that put donald trump into the white house and I think you have to acknowledge uh, that there should have been policies in place to assist those people who were adversely affected by trade agreements, which in aggregate uh, uh, advanced the, the economic living standards of everybody, but those advanced standards were denied to those who were most immediately affected. And until politicians and economists face up to the fact that when these agreements are done, they have very serious and substantial responsibilities to those who lose, then free trade or fair trade or whatever you want to call it is going nowhere. Um, I don't know if people in the room are aware of the elephant graph, uh, which uh, shows who has won and lost over the last 30 years in the global economy. Globalisation has delivered a massive increase in the number of people out of poverty, a massive increase uh, in the middle classes in the developing world and particularly in Asia and a massive decrease in the living standards of many middle classes across the developed world. So what we need, and that's what this project is about, is we need to put in place new economic frameworks that acknowledge that the living standards that, that, that come, the increase in aggregate living standards that come, have to be more fairly spread uh, around communities and countries that are engaged in those agreements. And I'm pessimistic about where we're going in terms of international cooperation. Donald Trump's first act was to say he was going to stop uh, the finalisation of Basel III which was all of the reform over the past six years to make sure that we don't have a repeat of the global financial crisis in the banking system. He's also said that he's going to dramatically cut company tax, which is the last thing the world needs, is a race to the bottom on tax. Because if you have a race to the bottom on tax, there's no way in the world governments will have the capacity to deal with the losers of change in their economies. So it's very important. Uh, it's hard to see any, any bright lights on the horizon. I think, though, um Donald Trump said in his election campaign that he was going to end the NAFTA agreement because this was a disaster for American workers and has since discovered that rather large um, amount of the content of Mexican exports into America um, is based upon um, components manufactured in America and then exported to Mexico as part of the production process. And he's backtracked rather quickly because he's realised rather a lot of American jobs depend upon the very trading relationships which he was trying to tell people were a bad idea. Um, so, it's, so it's always more complicated and populism, um, if it's done right, can be exposed. Uh, as Wayne says, um, what we've seen in the globalisation has been a huge reduction in poverty um, across the world, but big challenges um, for, 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 for groups in our societies. Um, I think, though, that telling people trade's bad, I think certainly for British and, American and Australian voters, I think people would be quite suspicious of that, because they sort of know that actually our prosperity and a lot of our companies and a lot of our jobs depend upon those trading relationships. On the other hand, if you tell people um, the status quo is just as good as it's going to get um, and you'll just have to lump it, um, what voters then do is vote for change. And that's what we saw in our referendum last year in the UK. So the answer is you have to have a policy platform for change and reform which doesn't move away from, open, from trade but makes it work in a, in a fairer and more long-term way. And as I said, I don't think you can do that country by country. So um, if Wayne was a finance minister here in Australia, I think he would be in the G20 demanding international action on growth and on tax reform and looking at the way in which we negotiate trade agreements to make sure that there were protections for labour um, within those agreements and all of those would be good things. And that's what we need. Uh, if governments aren't going to come together collectively and make the case for um, a fair global economy, we'll end up with more nationalism, reaction and populism, and that would be a very bad outcome. Our next question from Colin Brinston. Colin Brinston, IAP. Uh, thank you, gentlemen, for your thoughts on the GFC and its aftermath. Um, do you think sufficient regulation has been put in place since the GFC to prevent that sort of catastrophe happening again? And 
Wayne, you talked about you know, that, uh, how stimulating the economy helps you through such pain. If uh, something like that happened today, would you still be as gung-ho as you were in uh, 2008, given the state of the books? Well, I'll answer the last part first. Uh, it was argued um, you know, around 20, late 2009, 2010, that we should begin to withdraw our stimulus at a faster rate than we were withdrawing it. And we copped uh, two to three years of uh, abuse, uh, blackening all of our reputations in the parliament for continuing with that stimulus. But what happened during that period, 2010 through 2011, 2012, was we had the, uh, the Greece crisis, the European uh, banking crisis, the sovereign debt crisis, the debt cap in the United States. All of those things went on for years. I had sort of thought when we initially launched the package, maybe it's a bit big. Um, but as it turned out, uh, we had a tail on that that served this country really well. So at, come 2013, our economy was 15% bigger than it was at the end of 2007. Think about this. Our economy is now 25% bigger than it was at the end of 2007. Across 30-odd developed economies, the loss of output during the global recession was the equivalent between, 20, between 2008 and 2013 of the entire German economy disappearing. So we missed all of that. We continued to grow, and we have continued to grow because that intervention then was a structural ch change that really reinforced our economy and has enabled a terrific performance despite weak global growth. On your question about regulation, regulation is important, and I believe that the regulation that is now in place uh, internationally, uh, that is quite strong, and I think it is adequate, but uh, as it was during the crisis, as it is now, it, it more importantly depends on whether your regulators are up to it. You can have all the black letter rules you like, but are your regulators up to it? And we were fortunate that our regulators were up to it uh, during that period, uh, partially because of what a, the fallout, as it turns out, from HIH uh, and other events in the banking system a decade earlier. Uh, we, so we, we came through also, I think, because of the credibility of, of our regulators, uh, which wasn't there, say, in the case of the United States. Uh, so it's what, you, it's what your regulators do that's as important uh, as the rules. Did you want to add to the... That's fine. OK. Our next question uh, from Tim Shaw. Uh, gentlemen, Tim Shaw from Radio 2 C here in Canberra. Every one of my listeners needs a bank to do business with, whatever income structure they're on. Ed Balls, can I take you to the, the statements by the Deputy Leader of the UK Labor Party, Harriet Harman? She said in August 2009 to The Independent that the top jobs in UK banking, only five out of 61 and the top four British banks were occupied by women. Five out of the 61. She also made that, that age-old reference to if only Lehman Brothers had been run by Lehman sisters, would we have had the GFC? <laughs> Tell me what's changed in Britain in <laughs> banking in the last 10 years. And to you, Wayne Swan, it was a Labor treasurer that uh, sold the first tranche of the Commonwealth Bank. Uh, Catherine Livingston is the new uh, chairman of the Commonwealth Bank. Is she as much in the crosshair, having only taken over the chairmanship of the Commonwealth Bank in January of this year? And what advice have you got to bank boards here in Australia, Wayne Swan, if you were advising them on equity, diversity, to achieve the fairness that you hope to achieve in Australian banking going forward? All right, a lot of questions there. We don't have a lot of time. So Gosh. if you maybe pick one or two to answer there. Gosh. Well, I think um, as the recent transparency um, about salaries um, at the BBC show, um, 10 years on from the financial crisis, in some of our large institutions which are transparent, we have still got a long way to go um, to get to gender equality in terms of the number and the pay of um, senior people. That's in the BBC. Uh, and I think the BBC is probably doing a lot better job than most of our large corporations and, and, and banks. Um, so I think probably there's more work to be, um, to be done. Um, there have definitely been improvements in um, the, the quality of our bank leadership and capital um, and regulatory standards and the regulation uh, itself but I'm not sure whether um, they would pass Harriet Harman's tests um, and I think the evidence is 
um, that diversity in, in boards um, is really important because uh, the hardest thing about um, managing risk is is looking for the unexpected risk, the thing that you um, uh, that, that, that you aren't looking for, even if it's at the end of your nose. And the most dangerous thing is to have a group of people who all look, talk, and think the same. And having people on a board who are who are there to be to be different and to challenge and to ask different questions and think about things in a different way. Um, I think that's good corporate governance. So uh, um, I think more diversity in our boards uh, would be a helpful contribution to avoiding future financial crises. Whether Harriet Harman would accept a job mm -hmm. on a board is another question. I think um, too many of our, 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 our public and private sector boards, for that matter, suffer from a blindness of affluence. Uh, and many of these people are not actually in touch with their own workforces, let alone the community in which they serve. I also think that uh, taking a public monopoly and turning it into a private monopoly is not necessarily the smartest thing in the world to do. Um, in the case of our banking system, I believe we are seeing the arrogance of size play out. Uh, I believe uh, our, um, our, our private boards are a closed shop. Uh, they're drawn from an incredibly narrow group of people. Uh, and the consequence of that is a group of people who are out of touch uh, with the community. Uh, I, you see that this expressed itself best in the way in which the Business Council of Australia behaves. Still out there, like the Japanese sh soldiers in the, in the jungle of New Guinea 40 years later, uh, arguing the case uh, for neoliberal economics as a solution to Australia's, Australia's economic challenges. I mean, they appear to have learnt nothing uh, about what has happened around the world or in Australia in the last few years. I think we'll have to make this our last question from Bernard Keane. Uh, Bernard Keane from Crikey. Thank you, gentlemen, for your remarks. Um, inequality and its impact on economic growth seems to me to be one of the most fundamental challenges for neoliberalism, because if neoliberalism can't furnish economic growth, then it's got nothing else going for it. Um, the IMF's done some work on the transmission mechanism between inequality and lower economic growth, which it talks about as education. I'm wondering what your views are on how exactly inequality constrains growth and what best ways are there to try and mitigate that phenomenon? Well, I think, um, first of all, um, if, if, if inequality is driven by um, people who don't have um, uh, the, the investment in their education to make the most of their potential, that means that their earning power is lower, their contribution to the economy is lower, and, um, and growth is held back as, as a consequence. So um, if you have um, inequality of, in educational opportunity, and that, um, then, that is good, th th then that will lead to um, lower trend growth, and, um, uh, as well as inequality. But I think there is also um, a political aspect to this as well, which is that countries which have more inequality tend to find it harder to build consensus for long-term decisions and long-term investments. They are more likely to be politically unstable. They tend to lurch from crisis to crisis. And um, we know that the decisions which last, the good decisions which last, are the ones where you can build a, 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 a sense of consensus and national purpose. And um, that's lacking in some of our uh, societies at the moment because, um, and, and I think inequality is part of the explanation for the um, decline in public support for political decision making. So um, it's both about the quality of growth and also about um, political trust. If all you do to respond to inequality is invest in education, you're simply whistling past the graveyard. Uh, it won't be enough. Uh, two things really have to happen. You've got to strengthen the voice and the standing of Labor. Uh, you've got to have uh, strength and demand in your economy to give those people a chance to bargain. And secondly, you've got to have progressive tax systems. And those two things combined will achieve the ultimate objective, which should be to restrain the power of big money in politics. Because when you restrain the power of big money in politics, you then fundamentally get through the important structural reforms, like progressive taxation, that a country needs to grow fairly. We, we are going to have to wrap it up there. Would you please thank Wayne Swan? <laughs>